Ephesians chapter 2. You hear all about angels in the Bible. We know that. We know that they are spirit-created beings. This has been an incredible study. Some of your questions have really uh, caused me to have to really dig harder, and I appreciate that. I really enjoy the challenge. I really do, and, and uh, I'm thankful for this, but we've learned a lot about angels. And in your hand now, uh, the word angel literally means one who brings tidings, a messenger. We talked about that last week. A messenger. So angels literally are messengers of God. They're, they're God's messenger. And you see that all throughout the scriptures. But today, 2 Corinthians 5.20 tells us that we today are Christ's ambassadors. We represent Jesus Christ. We today are are his messengers. So, and still talking about the subject of angels, well, what part do they play in God's program today? If God's doing something different today than he was from the nation of Israel, and he is, and if he's doing something different today than he'll be doing in the future, and he is, then what part do angels have in that today? And really, do we even need them? That was a big question. Um, uh, how do they, uh, what, what part do they interact with us today? Um, how, how do they uh, correspond with us? Do, uh, can they see us? Um, can they, or do they guard us? Do they protect us? And, and uh, is every person assigned an angel? Uh, those type of questions have come from this. And I'm going to answer that, maybe not particularly tonight, although I do want you to know, and I said it to you last time, angels do watch you not stare at you, kind of a weird kind of watch that you need to get really nervous about, but they watch you, they observe you, I should say, that's probably a better word. They observe us because they are learning from us, which is an interesting study why they would have anything to learn of us. And we will actually get into that a little bit tonight. But uh, in your handout, I'd like for you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2 and, and look at some scripture because here is a three fold timeline. I gave this to you last week. We started that, but, but I think it would be good if you wrote some things in regarding it. Then let us look at the chart because the bottom line is if, if you don't understand this timeline, if, and it doesn't mean that you got to understand it in totality. Obviously, I have studied it out more than you have at this point, and I get that, and I understand that, and it's hard for you to grasp in a 10 or 15 minute time slot that we spend on it, what, what I've spent hours on and, well, really years on. But the point is this, if you can just grasp the, the superficial part of it, if you can just kind of skim the top of it, if you will, and get those three things that are in it, and from this text here in Ephesians chapter 2, it will help you line up Scripture every time someone brings out a Scripture. Every, sometime, every time someone tells you to go to a certain book in the Bible, it will help you if you will remember these three timelines. And tonight I'm going to, help, I'm going to ask you to do something a little bit different. Some of you may like to write in your Bible. Some of you may not. Uh, they're bringing some more handouts in tonight. Uh, and we ran out, and so if you want a handout, raise your hand if you didn't get one. And uh, I appreciate that. Thank God we ran out. Amen. And uh, thankful for that and appreciate you being here. But I'm going to ask that you write some things in your Bible. Years ago, I wrote these things in the uh, uh, context of my Bible. Went all the way to the front, uh, looked at where all the books of the Bible are, and I wrote some certain things down. And I'm going to ask that you write these things down. I don't have them in my Bible now because I, I've memorized it and understand it. But years ago, I wrote these things down in there. So every time I flip to a passage that someone told me, I already had in mind where I was on this timeline. And I'm going to help you do that in just a moment. I think it will help you every time you study your Bible, every time you hear a message, every time someone comes to the pulpit, wherever it is at that you may be, this will help click for you and help absolutely for you to understand how things have changed over the course of the history of the Bible. So, look at two verses with me. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Are you there? Say amen. Awesome. The Bible says, Wherefore, remember that ye being in... Say those next two words. Ready to begin. Time. Say it one more time. 
In your handout, right beside verse 11, would you write that in that small blank? Write the words, time past. Would you write that down? Okay, now let's finish reading. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past, Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands. Jew and Gentile, both mentioned right there. Verse 12, that at that time, what time, church? Yes, you guys are students of the Bible. That's referring to verse 11, of course. That at that time, what time? Time passed. Ye, talking about Gentiles, notice who you were in time past under a different program, under a different time period. Notice what the Bible says about you. This is incredible. That ye were without Christ. That ye were, ye were uh, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You were not a part of that program. And strangers from the covenants of promise. The promises that God gave them were not to you. Notice, having no hope and without God in the world. Look up here, church. Time passed. That would indicate, if I said to you, time passed, that would indicate what? That something has passed. That's right. We're dealing with something in the past. This is when God, here, time passed, that phrase that you just wrote down from verses 11 and 12, that is when God dealt with the world through the nation of Israel. You know that for... God used the nation of Israel as they converted that they would be a lighthouse unto all other nations unto God. And we understand that there was a middle wall of partition between Gentiles and uh, the nation of Israel. That Israel uh, absolutely enjoyed a favorite status. We understand that God was working through the nation of Israel. And that Israel had come from Abraham in order that the world would know who the only one and true God was through that nation. That was time past. Now look up there on the chart, and I'd like for you to flip your page over if you have it. And I'd like for you to look at that chart. You don't have to look up the screen unless you don't have one. But if you have a chart, look at it with me. Notice the cross work of Jesus Christ. You'll see the, uh, for you it's in black and white, maybe a little bit difficult, but it is in, uh, uh, there's a sunrise, there's three crosses right there representing the cross work of Jesus Christ. But notice to the left of that, Israel receives covenants of promise. They receive the hope of a redeemer. They receive the word of God. The word of God came to them through scribes and through uh, prophets and through, the, uh, through writings. And although they didn't have the completed word of God, the Messiah had come. This is all uh, uh, um, uh, in the past. This had all come to them. And the Messiah had come. He had come to earth. And what had been foretold was literally taking place in front of them. And what did the nation of Israel do? They said, no, we don't want you as our Messiah. No Jew would be found on a cross. That's literally what they said. You're not our Messiah. And by the way, uh, a, a Jew that has stuck to that uh, covenant, they are still waiting for Jesus, the Messiah, to come the very first time. Well, I have great news for you. He has come. Amen. He has already come. And, and, and the Gentile nation would be given over to idolatry and without hope. We just read that. The message of hope came to them, not to us. They rejected that. But something happened. After they had rejected that, something happened. And I want you to look now at verse 13 of Ephesians 2. We just wrote in time past, but notice verse 13. And notice the first two words. Say them with me of verse 13. Ready, begin. But, say it again. But, in Christ Jesus ye, talking about Gentiles, who were sometimes far off, uh, are made nigh by the blood of 
Christ in your handout beside verse 13. Right, but now. Okay? So, write the words, but now. Now, look up here. On your paper, if you're taking notes, you should have these two things. You should have time past, and you should have but now. Things have changed. If I was to say something to you, and I was going to say, hey, look, I had every intention on uh, bringing every one of you a $100 bill tonight, but I didn't have it. You almost got excited, didn't you? Man, he's going to pass out $100 bills. We fill this place up. There's a but. Something has changed. Amen. Do you get that? In time past, that's what was happening. But Paul said in verse 13, but now. But after the but now, notice those three words. In Christ Jesus. Do you see that? Boy, that was a good verse from Ephesians 1, 3 that we learned today. In Christ there that, there's that beautiful word. There's that beautiful phrase, in Christ Jesus. Israel's prophetic program has been temporary set aside. Look at your chart once again. I'll look on the black and white with you. I have a colored sheet up here in front of me, so I was cheating a little bit, amen? But uh, I, I'm going to identify with you. Notice at the cross, underneath that, there is an arrow pointing down. And notice... Christ was rejected by who? They rejected their Messiah. I just told you. So, so God, in his foreknowledge, hidden in him was a mystery. He set the nation of Israel aside. He didn't get rid of them. He did not replace them. He just took them and set them aside and ushered in a but now. What's the but now? Notice that part between the cross and the arrow going up. The arrow going up is the rapture. Notice that time period in that uh, section right there. What's it called? It's in big, bold, white letters or gray letters. What's it called? Grace period. Guess where you live today. You live in the grace period. You got it. You live really in Ephesians 2.13. You live in the but now. Okay? You're not in time past. You live in the but now. You live in this time period of God's word where grace and reconciliation are available to all through Christ. Amen? Aren't you thankful that you don't have to take the right of circumcision? Amen. I don't have to take a Nazarite vow. I mean, I can let my hair grow and cut it off. Brother Donnie, he'd like to be able to have to cut his hair a lot. Amen. And, and you know what? We don't have to go to and do sacrifices and rituals as they did. There's, there's no observance of feast days and observance of dietary laws. That was time past. Folks, I'm trying to get you to understand that angels, even during this time period, were doing something different. And if you can understand your Bible in just a minute, I'm going to put the actual books of the Bible that fit in every one of these time periods for you. So every time you hear a book of the Bible, you're like, whoop, that's time past. Oh, that's in the butt now. Oh, that's in the ages to come. Which brings me to the next part of your handout. Look at verse 7. We looked at verse 11 and 12, which is time past. We look at verse 13, which is the but now. But would you look at verse 7? And notice it says that in the ages to come. Would you say ages to come, ready, begin? Ages to come. He might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us. Through Christ Jesus. In your handout, would you write that down? Beside those verses, verse 7, would you write down uh, ages to come? Ages to come. And I think it would be fitting if we could read uh, verse 8 and 9 with verse 7. So verse 7, that in ages to come, 
he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus, verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Who gives the gift? It's God. What is he giving? He's giving grace. He's giving salvation. Notice verse 9. Here's the exclamation point, if you will. Here's the end of it, if you will, just in case you got it confused, just in case it's of your merit you think it is, or something that you could earn, or something that you deserve. God sets the record straight here. Verse 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. What an incredible statement. Not of you, lest any man should boast. Look at your uh, uh, um, handout or your chart, I should say. Notice the middle part, the grace period. Would you look up here? How many of you did anything to help that out right there? Go ahead and stand up and let's applaud you. Not of works. You didn't aid in the process. The only part that you had in the process was being redeemed. That's what you got. You got the better part. Yes, it was your sin that Christ went to the cross for. But my friend, you didn't have any part in the grace being dispensed. It is not of works. It's not of anything that you and I could do. It's all of Jesus Christ. It's always been of Jesus Christ. And even in the ages to come, it will be of Jesus Christ. Why? So that you don't boast. We like to brag, don't we? God knew, God knew exactly who he was dealing with. It's like, lest any man should boast. You guys are so prideful. If I give you any part of it, you'll just puff up. You'll blow up and tell people, look what I did. Look how good I am. God says, no, for by grace are you saved. Hey, folks, I don't know about you, but I thank God I live in the grace period. I thank God I live in the but now. I thank God for his miraculous work through the but now time period. I'm saying to you that God will, though in the ages to come, resume his covenant and prophetic program with the nation of Israel. And everything that he's promised, everything that he has made a covenant vow with the nation of Israel will be fulfilled. He will do exactly what he has said. He will set up a literal visible and physical visible, uh, physical kingdom on this earth for his nation. And I'm thankful for that. Say, what is all of this about? I have said all of this, giving you that chart, going over in Ephesians 2, verses 11, 12, 13, and 7, to say all of that. That there is some interesting facts in your Bible concerning angels. This is not in your handout, so I need you to listen. If you would look at your chart, and while I'm talking about it, you just kind of look at it. You don't even have to look up here. If you would find on the left-hand side of your chart the words time past, and just listen. In the time past portion of your chart, what we have talked about and learned about, this is dealing with Genesis through the book of Malachi, and the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So, if this would help you, why don't you go to the very beginning of your Bible and go to the, go to the table of contents, okay? Don't go to the books listed in alphabetical order, okay? That won't help you here. It'll, it might confuse you for this part of the study. And I don't know if you have room, but maybe you could write, maybe some of your Bibles, like mine, have a little bit of room at the bottom. Maybe there's a part on the page before it. Maybe you could write the words Genesis. Maybe you could write the words Genesis through mid Acts. Maybe you could write that. Genesis through mid-Acts. 
And then maybe you could draw a dash and put the words, time past. Genesis through mid-Acts, talking about the Acts of the Apostles, around Acts chapter 7 and 8. And maybe you could write down, if you desire to, write down beside that, or a, a, a dash, then write down, time past. See, the cross work had not taken place, folks, until the end of those books. Yes, they recorded it. But they wrote it after the event, obviously. Okay? And I want you to know that, that the cross work, the finished and completeness of it, was not even understood in its totality until after those books were written. And I'm going to get to that in just a minute. And so I want you to understand that from Genesis all the way through mid-Acts, Acts chapter 7, 8, that is dealing with time past. Now, in looking and studying angels out from Genesis all the way through that, angels are referenced about 200 times in that time period. So if you look at your chart, under this time period of time past, angels are referenced about 200 times. However... If you'd go to the middle section, which we learn from Acts 2, verses 11 and 12, the, um, the or verse uh, 13, excuse me, Acts 2, 13, the but now. Angels are only referenced in the but now time period 13 times. So 200 in time past, 13 in uh, but now. We'll say, what is the but now program? Well, if you are still in your table of contents, would you look at the New Testament part of your Bible? And would you notice the books of the Bible from Romans through Philemon? Those are 13 books that the Apostle Paul wrote. May I say to you, those are regarding the but now time period. So, if you go in Exodus, what should you already, already conclude, folks? What time period are you in? What about Hosea? Are you with me tonight? Did you write anything down or have you checked out already? What about the book of Malachi? What about the book of, this is going to do it, Matthew? What about Romans? But now, someone said time passed. Caught you. <laughs> Remember, Romans through Philemon are the books regarding the grace period that God is instituting right now through His Son, Jesus Christ, where He's offering grace and reconciliation to all through Jesus Christ, his son, I'm saying to you that Romans, uh, Romans through Philemon are the books that are regarded under the But Now program. And in the But Now program, those books, you only see angels referenced about 13 times. Now, before I get to the ages to come, matter of fact, let me give you that, then I'll come back to the But Now program and your table of contents because I want you to write something else in there that will help you. If you will look on your, on your chart in the ages to come, which is to your right, my, my left up here, because I've got it reversed to you. Uh, in the ages to come, in the actual uh, um, time past, 200 references. In the But Now, 13 references. And in the ages to come, angels are referenced uh, almost a hundred times there. Say, well, what are the ages to come uh, 
scriptures. Well, if we left off at Philemon, then what is left? You have Hebrews through the book of Revelation. Those books are regarding ages to come. Those books are defined under that. And so this will help you in that area. Now, there are two initials, AA and DA, that I'd like for you to write down, write down, AA and DA. AA stands for after acts. DA stands for during acts. Okay? So let me repeat that because I'm having you write a lot down that's not even in your handout. And, and maybe next week I will uh, put, a piece of, put a piece of paper together that may be attached. I don't want, don't want you to stop writing because you think I might do that. Um, this will help you. So AA means after Acts. DA means during Acts. I've had this, what I'm giving you in my Bible for years. It's been such a help to me. People have often asked, okay, if we live in the but now, I get it. We live in the age of grace. I get it. I understand where I live in regards to the nation of Israel. I get it. We're not Israel. I get it. I get it. I get it. But can you tell me those books that Paul wrote, I'd like to know uh, when did the Apostle Paul write those books, what period? Because your Bible, the way it's laid out, uh, it can get confusing on when it was actually written. And so if you would go through your New Testament, just the part of Romans through Philemon. So I don't know how your table of contents is, is broken up. And, uh, but if you have room to write, here's what will help you. Under AA and DA, I'm going to start with DA, which stands for during Acts. Everyone say during Acts. So during the Acts period, which means during the Acts of the Apostles. That's what that means. During the Acts time period. Okay? Here's what I want you to write down. Romans through Galatians and 1st and 2nd Thessalonians were written during Acts, during the later latter part of Acts. So during the Acts time period, Romans through Galatians and 1st and 2nd Thessalonians was written DA, which means during the Acts of the Apostles. Well, if that was written during the DA, then the rest of the books have to be AA under Romans through Philemon. So, just to make sure that you understand, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon are AA which means they were written after the Acts time period. Let me repeat just that last part in case I've lost you. If you have during Acts, DA, here are the books that were written during that time period. Romans through Galatians. So, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Second, uh, I just told you that, and Galatians. So those four books, and First and Second Thessalonians. That's DA. Now, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, First and Second Timothy, Titus and Philemon 
are AA books. So, all of that is to help you now understand what I'm about to give you. And not only what I'm about to give you, anytime someone brings something up out of the Bible, I don't care what subject it is, it doesn't matter what it is, it could be speaking in tongues, which is found in 1 Corinthians, actually it ends in 1 Corinthians, and if you have 1 Corinthians written down in your Bible, and if you have a note beside a 1st and 2nd Corinthians with Romans, you know that that should be a D-A. Right? Do you have that so far? Say amen. So if someone comes to you and say, well, what about speaking in tongues? Well, is it scriptural? You better believe it was. Did it happen? You better believe it did. Did God allow it? He sure did. Not only did he allow it, he created it. But you have to understand when it was done and the purpose of, of it happening. And it was happening during the time where everyone was being scattered and God was getting his word out to the nations and he was doing it through using people speaking in tongues, speaking a known language. It wasn't syllables, it was words. But you will put that in the wrong context for us today if you don't know when that book was written. And it's easy to get stuff all mixed up and go, well, that's what we should be doing today. We don't need it today because we have the completed Word of God. Before anyone goes to any other nation that speaks a language, you know what they do? They just don't show up and start speaking it. They have to go and learn the language. When this happened in the Bible... Man, it was instantaneous with a moving of the Holy Spirit. Whoop! They started speaking in Chinese. Don't even think I'm going to try to attack that right now. Some of you are waiting for me to do it. And you know what? Every person that heard it in their native tongue understood it. Why? It was a language, not syllables. But folks, if you don't put the scripture in its right context or understand what time period it's in or when it was written, man, you're going to get a hodgepodge of different things and it's just going to be a big old beef stew and we don't know what's in it. I'm going to tell you, you ought to know what's in it and you ought to make sure that it's always rightly divided so you can understand it. And God has written it so you can understand it. So let's get back to angels and with this chart, this will help you. So, number one, I want us to look at the main function, functions of angels in time past. How did they function? What did they do? But I also want to compare that to what they're doing today. So, in your handout, write this in. This will make sense to you now that I've given you that chart. Number one, in time past, angels are seen given instruction and understanding. In time past. Hey, don't, don't do it. Don't nobody look down. Look up here. What books are dealing with the time past? Genesis through? Huh? Yes. You under, you're getting it. So automatically, you know, all, Genesis all the way through mid-Acts, I already know that, yes, angels were seen given instruction and understanding. All right, I'm on it. So, let's go through of it. We're, through some of it. We're not going to look at all the verses. We are going to look up a few, but we're not going to look up all of them. You can do that on your own as a good student of God's Word. So, look at your handout, and notice it says, An angel instructed Gideon to deliver Israel from the Midianites. That's in Judges 6. We know that. Here's an angel. He came, gave specific instructions on what to do. Now, also in your handout, before we turn to several verses, write this in. An angel instructed Hagar to return to Abraham and Sarah. You can read about that in Genesis 16, 7 through 9. Now, I do want you to go to 2 Kings, and I do want you to get Zechariah chapter 1. All right? 
So 2 Kings, if you'd look that up, 2 Kings, and let's go to 2 Kings chapter 1, but I also want you to get Zechariah. Say, where is Zechariah? Well, if you have been a part of our study, we were in the book of Haggai today. And so if you were in the book of Haggai with us, um, Zechariah is a book to the right of Haggai. And so if you mark that or still have that note from this morning, our outline, then you are already set. All right? So it's the book to the right of Haggai, that's Zechariah. But you should be right now in 2 Kings chapter 1. 2 Kings chapter 1. So let's look at 2 Kings chapter 1, and let's look at verse 3 and 4. And notice this. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messenger of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, It is not because there is not a God in Israel that ye go to inquire of uh, Baalzebub, the god of Ekron. Now therefore thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but, but shalt surely die. And Elijah departed. Notice the angel came and gave a specific instruction to Elijah. And what did Elijah, Elijah do? He heard it and he got it done. He says, you go and you go tell those people what I have said and what I desire for you to do. So we know that uh, from that, uh, angels give uh, specific instructions and understanding. Now, leave Second uh, Kings and go with me to Zechariah. Would you go there with me? I'll give you just a minute to find it. Zechariah, and look at chapter 1. We'll look at several verses in Zechariah. This is another great book, by the way, where you see angels giving instruction. It's a perfect example where you see angels giving instruction and understanding. Hey, Zechariah, where is that at? That's in time past. I already know where I'm at. And I already know who we're dealing with. So, Zechariah chapter 1, look at verses 8 through 11. Here's a vision that came. He says in verse 8 and 9, I saw by night... And beheld a man riding upon a red horse. And he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom. And behind him there rode uh, their red horses, were their red horses, excuse me, speckled and white. Man, that's interesting. Speckled and white. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these be. Man, can you imagine that angel right there? Like, hey, what is this? And he goes, I'll tell you. Man, what, what a conversation that must have been. Look at verse 18. Same chapter, verse 18. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, four horns. Verse 19. And I said unto the, what church? The angel that talked with me, what be these? And he answered me, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Incredible. Look, look at verse um, 14. Back up. I'm sorry, I skipped one. Verse 14. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great jealousy. Notice this angel is giving instruction of what to say to some, but he's also giving understanding to those with vision. This is incredible. An angel is doing this. Look at chapter 4 of Zechariah. Chapter 4. Look at verses... 1 through 7, you, you know about this, the golden candlesticks. And the angel that I talked with, that talked with me, came again and wa waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. And said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick 
all of gold with a bowl upon the top of it and his seven lamps thereof and seven pipes of the seven lamps and which are uh, upon the top thereof. I've actually spoken about this and what this is and uh, what it's signifying and two olive trees by it. One upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof. So I said and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel, that thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. This is an incredible picture that one day there will be an absolute replenishing of God's power being poured out and his blessing upon the nation of Israel and it will be continual. Uh, that olive tree it, it obviously is signifying uh, the very Spirit of God and His power and His presence, and it will continue to be poured out. It will be an unending supply that will be continually filling those bowls because those bowls that are sitting there as golden candlesticks are right there as those uh, olive trees, and those olive trees will be absolutely supplying that uh, oil continuously. It will never run out. What a beautiful picture this is. But an angel described this and gave this. In Daniel chapter 10, we don't have time for that, Daniel sought for understanding uh, for a vision and an angel appeared to give him understanding. He, he needed understanding regarding a vision but I do want you, as uh, we wrap up tonight, go to Matthew chapter 1. Leave the Old Testament there where we are and go to Matthew, one of the four Gospels here. The Gospel according to Matthew, as it says in a lot of Bibles. Matthew chapter 1. And, and notice this account. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, the Bible says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, okay, before they knew one another, intimately, before they were absolutely married, and before they had be, uh, 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 consummated the marriage, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, he was a man of integrity, a right man, a good man, a holy man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. Hey, back in the day, she could have been stoned, and he knew the law. He was a good man. He was a kind man, and he didn't want to do that, or he didn't want to embarrass her, and, but he didn't understand. You got to under, here, Here's a husband, or a to-be husband, and all of a sudden he finds out his... Well, my fiance's pregnant, and I don't know her. And you can imagine the anxiety and the uh, nervousness and the concern they had. But notice, even through that time, he goes through this with grace and patience. But notice what happens. Verse 20. But while he thought on these things, he's contemplating on what to do. Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David... Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And all these things, all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, 
And he knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. I find that interesting, that last part as well. No human tainting involved at all in the virgin birth of our Savior Jesus Christ. Won't you know, man had nothing to do with it. It was all God. Amen? Woo, look at the purity of our Savior right there. Man, doesn't that give you some holy goosebumps? Amen? Man, I'm thankful that he was pure. And an angel comforted Joseph. Listen, all of these examples that I've given you, all these that, that are in your handout and the ones that weren't in your handout, listen, all of what I just gave you are under time past period. You can take that chart and you can go through your entire Bible and you can read any portion of Scripture and you can put it under one of those categories. You really can. You can take any Scripture and put it under one of those categories. You can put it under time past, the but now, or the ages to come. And folks, there's no doubt about it where we live. We live in the but now period where God is dispensing His grace. But would you look at your chart one more time? Then we're gonna then we're gonna pray. We're gonna take the offering. Then we're gonna go. Would you notice one more time with me? I thank God that we live in the but now period, and I thank God that we live in this grace period. What a beautiful time that God has given unto us an opportunity that He has. But would you notice the rapture? The, I just gave it away. Would you notice the arrow going up? Sorry about that. And uh, that arrow going up represents the rapture. Would you notice on your chart, after the rapture, okay, the arrow going up, notice at the very top of the arrow, uh, there's a box, and, and there's three words in there. It's believers called up. Okay, that's the rapture. The word rapture is not really in the Bible, okay? But we get the word rapture from that phrase, being called up, suddenly taken away, just raptured out. That's where we get that word from. But do you realize what happens right after that arrow? Would you, would you notice, not the arrow coming down, not the arrow going up, but between the arrow going up and the arrow coming down, which is the second coming of Jesus Christ to this earth, would you notice what happens in that part? What happens? God's wrath and His judgment. May I say to you that we live in a great time period, and I'm thankful for that, but that time period is going to end someday. And it'll be good for us, but it will not be good for all those who do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Folks, when will that arrow happen? I don't know, and neither do you. If it happened tomorrow, if God said... If he allowed us to know tomorrow at precisely 4, 12 p.m., there is going to be a rapture of all those that are in Christ. Man, we're going to get caught up. We're going to meet him and them in the air. It'll be a glorious day, but it's going to be right at 4, 12 p.m. That moment, as soon as the clock strikes 4, 12, would you... Ask yourself and be honest just between you and the Lord right now. Have you done all that you can do in this grace period to let others know about the grace that God is dispensing to keep people from His wrath? Have you done all that you can do? Have you said all that you could say? Have you pleaded and begged with all those that are lost? And by the way, every one of you in here tonight know a lost, unsaved, unregenerated, un unregenerated person who is on their way to hell. You know a person just like that. And if you do, then my friend, that little parenthesis that we live in, that grace period, it's going to end someday. And when it ends, listen, have you taken and seized the opportunity to let others know that there is a better day coming for us, but for those that are without Christ, listen, it's going to be an eternity of judgment. Help them get prepared for that. 
Help them not to see that. Help them to come in to this reconciling that God is doing through the grace and cross work of Jesus Christ. Let's be, let's be at work this week spiritually. Let's listen to God's word. Let's hear it. And then let's make sure we give others the opportunity that they can hear God's word, that they can make a decision this week to prepare themselves for the day of judgment to come. I thank God for the, ju for the grace period that we live in. I thank God that I'm being saved from the wrath to come. But you know what? That should be an awareness to me and awareness to you that not everybody has made that decision. Let's help them. Let's at least give them the truth for them to make a choice. And then after that, it is their decision. But we ought to do all that we can to make sure that they know that Jesus Christ will save them if they call upon him. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for tonight. God, we just pray and thank you so much for your word. Thank you that we understand where we live. We can understand, uh, Lord, how your word is to be broken up. We understand trying to put it in its right context. And God, there are things in the Bible that we can't wrap our mind around in totality. There are things that the Spirit has not illuminated to us. There are things that we can't understand. But one thing that we can understand is where we belong in the Bible. And, and we understand who is our apostle for today. We understand uh, no one would question that you gave apostles back then in time past. That you sent prophets. No one would even question that. But today it's almost dismissed or ignored but yet, God, you've done that. You've given that to us. You have written a direct letter to us. God, may we heed it. May we observe it. May we learn from it. And Lord, may we take what we've learned and help others to hear that great good news. Hear that great message that through the cross work of Jesus Christ, Lord, it doesn't matter what uh, ethnicity a person is. It doesn't matter what religious background they have. All that come to know Christ must come through the finished and completed work of the cross. There is one way, and Jesus is that way. And so, God, I pray that we will be fervent in giving that message. And, Lord, that we will be diligent in doing so to glorify you and to spread the word of God abroad. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Ushers, would you come?